do I have your permission to use this in whole and in part with exception to the stuff at the front that we just talked about, right? The stuff that's uh, the stuff that is pre-interview. Obviously, there's no no reason to show that. But other than that, can I reshare this in whole and in part on social media? You most definitely have my permission to share everything from this point in whole okay. or in part on social media. Yes, 100%. Okay. Please introduce yourself and let us know what it is that you do. Fantastic. Thank you so much for um, for having me and for having this chat. I think there's so much alignment between, you know, the work that you do um, all the way over in Japan and the work that I'm doing here in the UK. My name, for people who don't know me, my name is Deborah Hartung and I am a culture and leadership expert, some call me. So I work in the organizational culture design and transformation space. And of course, a very big part of that work is leadership development, coaching, um, because our leaders really help set the tone and create the culture. So they are integral to any kind of design or transformation work that we do. What questions do you think we should be asking ourselves about transforming organizational culture and leadership? Oh, that is such a, a heavy loaded question. Wow, there's a million that we should be asking ourselves. And you've made the mistake, Tim, of asking someone with ADHD um, to answer questions off the cuff. So, we, you know, we tend to ramble because, you know, my mind goes a million different directions. I think for me, the crux of the answer here, um, the main question that we need to be asking ourselves is, do we truly understand what we are dealing with? So in other words, where we're starting and where it is that we want to be. And the reason why I say that is because in my experience, and I've been doing this work for over 20 years now, in my experience, no organization truly understands where they're starting. They don't understand the different culture archetypes. They don't understand how the organizational structure, their decision-making processes, um, all of those tiny little actions and behaviors compounded over time has created a specific culture. So a lot of times they are in complete denial as to exactly what it is that they're dealing with, number one. And number two, therefore, they don't fully understand what it is that they want to get to and how that looks. So a lot of times we'll hear people saying, oh, you know, they, they want a, a caring, compassionate, people-first culture. That's great. But do you really, you know, what does that really look like to you? What does that mean to you? Because your idea of people-first is different to mine, number one. And number two, do you truly understand what it's going to take to get you from where you are right now, which is maybe a cutthroat, you know, siloed, um, gatekeeping, competitive kind of an environment to a kind of more inclusive people first environment. And if you truly understand that and you can answer those questions, we can start working. But a lot of times I think there's a whole piece of work that we need to do before we start, which is the truly understanding what you're dealing with, and where you'd like to get to. What are the most significant challenges you face in transforming organizational culture and leadership? I think the most significant changes is really the unpredictability of the humans that we're working with. You know, so again, coming back to your first question around knowing and understanding. So my approach is very much rooted in the fact that leaders create culture. And just like we can map leaders' personalities, and, you know, we've got different tools that we can use. We've got Myers-Briggs, and we can use Insights Discovery. We can use DISC. I personally like using Insights Discovery and a tool called Lumina. Same thing where we are categorizing in four main categories, and, and we're using very non-threatening colors speak to describe the, the typical behaviors that we would see associated with that archetype. The same way that we can do it for people, we can do it for organizations. And what I find is organizations that are very steeped in hierarchy, process, certainty, analysis. You know, so if you think almost traditionally, your, your, your financial service providers, your banks, 
um, you know, any kind of state entity, they tend to be like that. Organizations that are very stuck in that place um, or very stuck in the old school capitalist idea of business, which is get the results, deliver the competitiveness. Um, those things come at a price. And the price that they come at is they cost us the human interaction and connection. They cost us the empathy and the people first, the inclusion, the belonging. They cost us agility and adaptability. They cost us innovation and learning. And the biggest challenge that I find is that when we have a culture that is sitting in that hierarchy space, um, that process-driven space, or that very competitive space, or a combination of those two, is actually moving those leaders to a different place. Because how the culture landed up there in the first place is a reflection of who those leaders are and what they truly believe. So what we see on the surface of the culture is really just a manifestation of very deeply held beliefs and attitudes about people, about work, um, about progress and profits. And the work that we need to do is not, you know, it's not the change plan and the comms plan and the surface level stuff of, you know, designing values. The work that we need to do, the challenging part, is working with those individual leaders to help them identify the beliefs that they hold that they didn't even know that they have. And those beliefs are driving their behavior. You know, so for us to change their behavior, we need to go and find what's sitting underneath it. And the biggest challenge is doing that work. Um, because, of course, some people just don't really want to change, you know, and then you need the backup behind that from a neuroscience perspective um, to be able to change habits is you need certain structures in place within the organization, like performance management um, is one of the tools that we can use. Recognition and reward is one of the other tools that we can use. And again, if we have a senior leadership team that pays lip service to all of these things, when times get tough, they don't want to fire the highest performing sales exec, Tim, because he delivers great numbers, but he's a really awful person to work for. And it's, you know, it's getting people to understand that it's about the quantifiable measures, the business measures that we're used to, but it's also about the qualitative measures around employee experience and, and how people are treated. And that's the toughest thing to change. Awesome. So while you were talking about that, I was thinking about uh, perhaps a, an exception to the idea of that it's the leader's attitudes, because I totally agree with that. Also, if you have a new leader, that is, they will not only inherit, it could be a combination, and tell me if you, if you disagree, but it could be, be a combination of the last leader's beliefs and then as that leader leaves, say a CEO leaves and a new one comes in, that's the culture that he then inherits or she then inherits. So it'll be that plus the deeply held beliefs, the industrial revolution mentality, shut yes. up, get in line and behave because there's somebody else who would take your job kind of mentality stacked on top of it. So it could be the previous leaders plus the existing leaders together especially yeah, if they're it's, similar. It's 100%. And it's interesting that you say, especially if they're similar, because we find, and I'm sure you've seen this a million times as well, we find this all the time, this whole concept of hiring for culture fit. We hire people who are like us. You know, so you, you're automatically going to hit it off. If you are a very conservative leader, you like facts, you like data, you like process and hierarchy and, you know, that's above your pay grade and don't ask these questions. You're not going to gel with me automatically because of my approach around innovation and adaptability and agility and just the energy that I, 
just the way that I show up in the world is going to already grate you. So it's highly unlikely that you're going to hire me as your successor, even if I'm perhaps what your culture and your organization needs. Mm -hmm. So we tend to hire people who are like us. And yes, they might be a little different. You know, they, they might be a younger generation. They might not have all of the toxic beliefs that we have. Um, but they've got their own toxic beliefs, you know. Again, mm -hmm. anything when we take it too far can also become problematic. Um, so like you say, you're dealing with so many levels and just this really complex, nuanced um, organism. And it's this living, breathing organism that's constantly changing. And that is what is so challenging, but also what is so exciting and so rewarding when we actually get the foundational stuff right and we have all of those pillars and everything is working together beautifully and we're actually seeing progress. That is, it's magic and it's alchemy and it's just amazing. In fact, I was recently listening to a book. I can't remember the name of the book, but it was exactly what you said. It was like this guy says, well, the way I hire is I look for this, 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 and this. And then he went, oh, I'm describing myself. That's not good, is it? That was the quote in the book about somebody who became aware once they articulated it, that in fact, they look to hire people who are like them. But the fact that he became aware, it isn't enough to eliminate the bias, but it's certainly enough to then put, you know, systems and processes in place to, um, consider for that or or neutralize the bias by involving other people or having sort of counter countermeasures to that bias. So love that. Awareness precedes change. That's, you know, the awareness and whether it is self-awareness that we help to create or whether we're creating the awareness with data, you know, mm -hmm. so I, I do a lot of work with a, a company called Team Foria, which is an employee engagement and culture platform. And we've got a a culture baseline survey that we de um, developed in conjunction with Gallup. Um, and that's a great place for us to go and get a lot of this data to create the awareness to say, you might think your culture is X, but when you go and look at the data, this is what it's telling us, you know, and you then need to decide is, are you happy with this or do you want to change it? Mm -hmm. um, and as you say, the challenge that we're doing, we're dealing with here is, we are constantly trying to shape the invisible and it's invisible to us and it's invisible to the people that we're working with. And as you know, not everyone is always comfortable with that level of self-awareness that we're asking them to step into. And not everyone is comfortable with going that deep and realizing, you know, what, what what's the Taylor Swift song? It's me. Hi, I'm the problem. You know, um, not everyone is comfortable with, with realizing that. Could you describe a recent situation where you felt that a leader could have benefited from additional training in culture building, leadership, or both? Oh, my God. Every day of my life. To <laughs> literally every day of my life. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it's interesting that you say that. And, I mean, again, in, in my experience, People are promoted into managerial roles, you know, and we call it leadership, but we reward them and we recognize them for management behaviors. So the planning, the organizing, the control. I mean, I remember when I was at university, um, management was described as having four aspects to it, planning, organizing, leading and control. That's what I was taught, like leadership was part of management. Mm -hmm. Instead of it being, instead of leadership being its own thing. Um, and I mean, this is in the 90s and yes, thinking has changed, but a lot of people are still stuck there. And I've seen situations just the other day, I was working with a team, um, you know, doing a little bit of work around team cohesion and things like that. And it was very clear to me that the manager, al although really well-intentioned, um, they themselves were in way over their head. And they did not have sufficient understanding of team dynamics, of how to resolve conflict. They, they themselves didn't understand. You, you talk about that collective personality. So they didn't understand 
the collective personality of the team. The team itself isn't toxic. They're very lovely people. They're mostly people, people, highly empathetic. You know, can we all just get along? So all of the things that we want to see, but when we take that too far, it becomes people pleasing and it becomes avoiding conflict. And there's this, you know, there's this surface level agreement, but actually everyone is fumingly angry beneath the surface and there's resentment and there's burnout that's busy rearing its head because certain people feel like they're they're doing more than they should be doing and and some of their colleagues are lazy but they don't have they don't have the mechanisms to give that feedback they don't know how to set boundaries they don't know how to disagree in a healthy constructive manner and they've got the deeply held belief that conflict is bad they've not seen that conflict can actually be good and can help move us forward so literally just two days ago i saw in living color in you know as my kids always say in in 4k in front of me i saw this playing out where the manager could have benefited from this type of intervention and quite frankly the entire team could have also benefited and that's the mistake that we make is we promote people because they're good at their job the transactional stuff, and then we give them no leadership skills or tools, and we just expect them to just survive. And and they're drowning, you know, not just in the volume of work, but in all the people stuff and the relationship stuff that they've never learned. Daniel Pink said it in Drive. He was talking about results only work environments. And mm-hmm. I really love that because, you know, the mastery, the autonomy and the purpose being drivers of motivation, especially for creatives, rather than a factory worker, just work faster, you get more money. In that situation, well, especially if you're highly qualified, if you're unhappy, you just go find another job or you step out on your own. And that's the thing that many companies post COVID have to realize that people now know they don't really need their employer. Because if their employer can make X money with them, they can make X plus something that is the individual, the skilled individual can make X plus some profit margin without their employer. It's not easy to do, but clearly they didn't employ you because they were being kind. They employed you because you were at least paying for yourself and almost certainly paying for yourself plus making profit for them. So it's really worth them doing, even even if only for greed. If all they care about is money, then they need culture change and leadership training. I agree with you 100%, but I think, unfortunately, most organizations are still in that results-only space. They're stuck there. Mm-hmm. And I think most of them don't understand. You know, when you and I talk about value and we talk about making money, um, and we talk about things like, you know, retention or knowledge management and retention um i think too many business leaders and managers don't understand that we can quantify the value of those things they they speak in spreadsheets and profit margins and you know but they don't look at the people aspect and that's partly as the people profession that's partly our own fault um, but, but there's, I think, lots of factors at play here, but they're not looking at the quantifiable aspect of, um, you know, they'll talk about client lifetime value, but they're not looking at employee lifetime value. You know, they're not looking at what am I worth to you? You're hiring me for, you know, $150,000 a year, um, but that's what you're paying me. But what am I worth to you? Um, if I stay with you for 10 years, you know, mm-hmm. my learning, my growth, my experience, um, being a good leader, what am I really worth to you? And it's obviously there's formulas to do this. I'm not a mathematical person, but I know that these formulas exist and I, and I know to go and do these calculations. And I think when they start looking at the value of people and all of the stuff, culture, you know, engagement, retention, when they start looking at all of these things in 
in a way and a language that they understand, which mm-hmm. is quantifiable, mathematical. When they start doing that, I think that's when the game is going to change. I think we've made the mistake of making all of this sound fluffy and, you know, and telling them the ROI <laughs> is going to be X, but we're not actually drilling down into the, the granular detail for them. And I've just had this epiphany while we're speaking. Oh my God, we've been doing it wrong. We have been selling it wrong. Mm-hmm. And we need to speak to them in their language. We're always saying about, you know, what's in it for me when you're doing a pitch or something. We're not explaining to those leaders, those results first leaders. We're not explaining it to them in their language. We're explaining it in our language from mm-hmm. our place of, you know, psychological safety is as important as your health and safety policy is as important as mm-hmm. your what your balance sheet says. We're doing it wrong. What specific outcomes would you hope to achieve through training in leadership and culture building? Oh, again, I think it's, it, it differs, you know, from client to client, um, organizations. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the main outcomes that I, that I always strive to see is we can class it under awareness and empathy. So I know that I've done a good job and that we're on the right track and the things that we're implementing are succeeding when people start using different language without thinking about it, where we've created sufficient self-awareness and we've given, you know, we've shared enough employee data and, you know, with Team Fourier, we've got constant pulse surveys and we've got things and we, we've got enough that we can show them and they're, they're starting to get it. And they're mm-hmm. starting to, they're starting to change the way that they behave. And that deep level empathy of, I don't have to necessarily 100% be able to understand what you're saying, or even it doesn't necessarily have to resonate with me, or I don't have to agree with it. I just have to believe that that is your experience. Mm -hmm. And for me, when we get to that place, that is a game changer. You know, when when one employee can speak up and say, or, or we can look at data and say the sales team maybe on paper financially is doing great, but the survey data is telling us that they're not doing great. Trust is low, camaraderie is, is, is you know, falling from what it was. That means that there's a problem. And the minute people can understand that and say, okay, well, even though I, I think the sales manager is great, and you know, it doesn't matter with it, what you think and what you believe, as long as you can understand that, understand and, and and take on board that their experience is different and that we need to do something to change it. And I find with that awareness and that level of empathy, what comes with that is a willingness to at least try. Mm-hmm. And that for me is the magic. So, you know, culture transformation isn't a one and done. That's why no. traditional change, that's why traditional change models like Cotter and all of those don't work for culture change because it's never done. It's constantly, it's something that we're constantly measuring um, and that we're constantly working on. And it's constantly evolving. As you say, we change a manager here, you know, we acquire a new company, we've got to lay off some people, whatever it is, the minute any of those things happens, it has an impact on the people. And it has an impact on the culture. And that is why employee listening is so important and why we need to create an environment where our leaders are committed to awareness, whether it is through data and employee listening or self-awareness, and they're committed to the empathy to at least be willing to to try something different um, and do something new, even if they don't that's not their experience. They don't 100% agree with the experience or what's, Mm -hmm. what's being said that they still act on it. And they're willing to try something different. Chimpanzees with darts are just as good at picking stocks as the professionals more accurately Mm. at managing the, at managing the investments because they pick the professionals, pick them better. 
but then don't divest them any mm-hmm. more effectively than a rookie. Right. Yeah. So, and that's, anyway. that's that lack of awareness. And that's like you say, mm-hmm. I'm assuming that my judgment is absolute and it mm-hmm. is correct and it's factual, you know? Um, and the minute I make that assumption, I start behaving in a certain way and I start closing myself off to anything that could potentially shake that notion of mine. Whether it is the survey data, whether it is someone physically coming to tell me, listen, I know that you think Tim is great, but he's a freaking nightmare to work with. You know, um, <laughs> I'm just not going to want to hear it because because Tim is my golden guy. I hired mm-hmm. Tim myself. We, you know, he's been with me since the beginning. And it's like people get so caught up in that stuff. And mm-hmm. when we at least can break that away and we can create that that willingness yeah. and that empathy and going, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I've always, you know, had a great relationship with Tim. I didn't, I didn't realize, I'm so sorry, this is your experience. Tell me more, you know, right. instead of just dismissing and being like, no, that's impossible. Tim is my best salesperson. He's a rock star. You know, you must be the problem. Um, and I think that's where a lot of our challenges with this stuff comes from is because our people who've got the power to make the changes are stuck in that place of, you know, their perception is their reality and they're completely unshakable. And again, mm-hmm. is that belief, and you know, from a neuroscience perspective of, you know, if I agree that perhaps your experience is different and perhaps Tim isn't a great guy, then what does that say about me? Because mm-hmm. I've always thought he's fantastic. You know, and then it comes back down to, you know, am I brave enough? to to question myself and my own judgment and am i brave enough to admit that i too can make mistakes sometimes or i've had blinkers on and i've allowed tim to get away with things because because Mm -hmm. i think he's such a great guy so there's so much to this and we can talk about this for days it's i love this stuff in your opinion what are the key skills and competencies that leaders need to create a thriving organizational culture <laughs> again we can write a book on this term right mm-hmm. so the key so in terms of competencies i find that um first and foremost is empathy and and, and really you know not just being a, a genuinely nice person like empathy for me is is key um self-awareness is key um adaptability some level of adaptability and agility, a willingness to change, you know, um, is key. And again, with a lot of legacy leaders, we find those are completely lacking. Those are not their strengths at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So just adaptability, I think, if I had to whittle it down to three, I would say empathy, um, adaptability, and I would say we can call it vulnerable vulnerability and authenticity that that willingness to be human um maybe it comes down to accountability i'm not quite sure what one word we can use to describe that thing of being human being vulnerable and owning owning your shit mm-hmm. um whether you made a mistake or whether you behaved in an awful way, you didn't know everything, you know, you made a, a decision um, without having all the facts, owning that stuff, not blaming anyone else for it. Um, and then another one, and this relates to empathy, I suppose, but self-compassion. Because mm. I'm seeing as well, like, a lot of leaders are willing to forgive others and they're willing to show kindness and compassion to others, but not to themselves. And the minute they stop being so hard on themselves and they start speaking to themselves like they would a friend or a colleague in a more supportive, forgiving, um, growth mindset oriented way, again, Mm -hmm. you know, the game changes. But if I, if I have to whittle it down, I would say um, empathy, adaptability, and then this this word that we are yet to find that describes 
authenticity, vulnerability, and accountability rolled up into one. Right. That for me yeah. is is the key. Yeah. It's hard to actually blame people for saying, I choose survival. That's like at the yeah. core of our biology to do that. But I think that's, again, that's a whole separate conversation. And I think that's why a lot of organizations misunderstand psychological safety or think that it is that, you know, psychological safety and accountability can't, it can't coexist like they're mutually wow. exclusive somehow. Yeah, and they're not. And unfortunately, as you say, there, there are some mistakes and, and there are some actions at work that unfortunately are going to get you fired. You know, that you are going to lose your job. Um, but those mm -hmm. are, I think those are the exception to the rule. What we're mm -hmm. talking about here, you know, it's we can't change what we don't know. We can't mm -hmm. learn from what we don't know. Um, and we can't fix what and we're unaware of. Exactly. So if no one's speaking up, we, we can't action these things. And 99% of the time, speaking up is going to be a teachable moment. And it's going to lead to, you know, learning and evolution and, and continuous improvement. Um, mm -hmm. And very seldom there's going to be a, you know, th there's going to be a negative consequence for, for someone who did speak up. Um, because right. there's got to be that balance as well. Still, you want to save more lives. You need more people to be able to, even in that situation, be capable of admitting those mistakes, right? Mm -hmm. And that's pretty high and, stakes. And a, lot of times, and a lot of times, they're not necessarily mistakes. Again, in that environment, and it's fascinating for me working, because I work with the NHS. It's fascinating for me working with medical practitioners how... I think also because of life and death and because so much is on the line, how risk averse many of them have become, you mm -hmm. know, but a lot of times in the course of treatment, it's not a mistake when it's happening. You're, you're you know, you're acting based on the information that you have right. at the time. And it then turns out, you don't know someone is allergic to a specific antibiotic until they have an allergic reaction. You know, so was it a mistake to give them the antibiotic to try and treat the infection and save their life? No, it was not. Mm -hmm. But you've now learned that they had an allergic reaction, you know, and hopefully you 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 could do something in time to still save their life. Um, right. And I think that's also where that continuous improvement comes from and why it's important for people to understand. And again, we can have a whole conversation about the deeply held beliefs around perfection versus mm -hmm. the world that we live in now where you know starting something taking an iterative approach imperfect you know progress over perfection imperfect mm -hmm. first draft is better than unstarted perfect final product you know right. so That's right. having something imperfect that we can all work on and, and i've i've had this conversation with many people on culture transformation projects, the imperfect first draft of a thing that we can all work on and iterate and improve is better than having nothing. Right. And I've I've had people look at me like I'm insane. Um, I've had it held against me that it's an imperfect first draft. Um, and it's interesting for me just what people's approach is to this because how do we know that this is not the right thing if we don't try? If we don't at least get it out and we, you know, um, it's just absolutely fascinating how risk averse some people are and what their understanding of consequences um, and the stakes might be. Right. And well, how I they'll like what... rather be perfect than mm -hmm. make a mistake. What is the, and I'll put it in quotes, ideal duration for a comprehensive course on transforming organizational culture, leadership, or both? A, an actual course to teach people how to do this? Yeah. So I'm saying if you go into an organization and we're talking about, let me qualify comprehensive in that they're, let's say they're at, at, at zero for, for argument's sake. Okay. That is, they need, they need the whole kit and caboodle. They need everything to be uh, done. As you already acknowledged, it's never done. However, getting them from 
train wreck to, okay, they're on a good trajectory. And then we might do intermittent check-ins every quarter or year or whatever. So that getting them from train wreck to on the right path, only needing check-ins So at least on the rails. Well, um, look, this is very, very difficult because I think the work that I do is very different. My approach mm -hmm. is very different. I do 90-day culture transformations. Okay. Um, so, and the reason why I'm able to successfully do that is because I combine the data that we can get from, from Team Foria, from the technology that we have, with mm -hmm. neuroscience and hyper-personalized leadership development. So mm -hmm. we don't have a linear change plan. You know, mm -hmm. we get the data and we go and change and develop and teach and coach and everything what needs doing where it needs doing. Right. Whilst also reinforcing some of the structures. So my answer would be, if I have the full buy-in, the tech and the structures that I need, I can make miracles happen in 90 days. Right. Okay, um, I like that. Because we're, because we're using an agile approach. Um, and again, you know, and, and because we're working with personalities and things, you as a manager here with your profile and the data in your team, you might need intervention A but not mm -hmm. B and C. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to waste time taking you through A, B and C when you only need A, you know? Right. Um, so, so we, we, we deploy what's ne what's needed where it's needed and right. we do so simultaneously and concurrently. So mm -hmm. it's not a linear waterfall thing. It is an agile cyclical right. thing. And we literally, we have a season of change. Um, so that is very doable, but there's things that I need to have in place before we do that. Realistically speaking, that doesn't always happen. We don't always have the leadership buy-in. We don't always have the tech. We don't always have the data. Um, it takes a minimum, in my experience, from train wreck to seeing seeing some change. It usually takes about six six to 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, again, depending on the organization, the size of the organization, the buy-in from senior leadership and the tools that we have at our disposal and then also the the other pillars that we need in place like performance management, like um, talent management. You know, if, if we're not, if we're going to continue to hire, fire or promote the wrong people, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what leadership development we're doing. It doesn't matter what what technology we're using to gather data. We're going to keep on having the same problem because we're continuously recognizing and rewarding the wrong stuff. Yeah. Um. So so there's a couple of levers that we need to work with to work miracles. But yeah, it can be done, and it has been done successfully in ninety days, one quarter. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to read back. I, I, I summarized what I understand. So here's an opportunity. I'll admit that I am not perfect and I am subject to errors. So here we go. 90 day culture transformations with leadership buy-in and a strong assessment, otherwise six to 12 months. And of course, this is still, let's call it comprehensive initial, because realistically, as you said, there's always going to be some ongoing component. Yeah, I think I think that's, you know, the quickest we can see turnaround in a team. Mm -hmm. Um if we're working directly with the leader and just that team, the quickest we can see a massive turnaround time will be 6 weeks. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, I I would say I would say that you summarize that pretty, you know, pretty well. Uh, okay, and then I'm going to add that other thing. So, uh, but six weeks maybe for a team. Yeah, Individual because you're talking teams. about a, yeah. right, a, a smaller entity. Yes. For an individual team. Yeah, because it's, it's 
I mean, you know, there's there's beliefs we have to challenge and change. There's behaviors that we need to put in place that we need to repeat because else it's just the one and done, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you're taking a manager who never has check-in conversations with their team, never really speaks to them about how they're doing, never does anything around continuous improvement, never does any reflective practice, anything like that, you know, they're not going to buy that the, the manager has really changed in six mm -hmm. weeks because it's it's going to be a couple of one and done things. But when mm -hmm. it starts being repeated and we survey those employees again, that's when we start seeing the, the needle shift. Yeah. Right. Well, that's uh, the one thing that really took me back. I've only listened to one book by Marshall Goldsmith, but I really loved what he said. And that was... I don't get paid unless the reports of the leader who I'm working with basically gives him passing marks on the changes that needed to be done. That is, he doesn't get paid unless the people who report to his client say, yes, they're doing well now, they're getting better, whatever it is. There's criteria, and the criteria are not coming from the person who needs the change. They're coming from the person affected by the changes or the people affected by the changes. I yeah. I just so admire that accountability in a world where it's like, well, we do this and then, you know, it's not our fault if it doesn't work. It's like, well, it no, kind of is. Otherwise, why are you there? Yeah. Well, well, our thing is, is kind of, you know, we say we don't get paid, but I mean, ours is, you know, we'll give you your money back. If you've done everything that we told you to do and that we taught you to do and the marks are not better. We'll give you your money back. Respect. You know? um, That's what we need because, to do. Yeah, that is what we need to do. That is how much we believe in what we do. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you work with us and you do all the things and it still doesn't work, then I'm really sorry. Then here's your money back. Sorry for right. wasting your time. You know? Yeah. It's like, if you are so confident and so few are, right? A lot of people is like this always works for everybody. And it's like, so in other words, if I don't get the results I want and I've taken the behaviors or taken the actions you said, you'll give me my money back, right? It's like, oh, well, no, we can't do that. It's like, then you aren't really as confident as you claim to be. It's like, you know, put up or shut up is, is really the way I think about it. If it's so, if you're so confident, why does your confidence disappear the, the moment? When there's money involved. Yeah, the moment the moment that you actually have to do it from the other side, yeah. you say you you guarantee the results, except you really don't guarantee them, and you blame yeah. the the clients. Yeah. You're right. You can't make them do the steps, but if they do the steps and it still doesn't it work, still doesn't now work. you are accountable. 100%. Thank you. I, yes, and you I will get that. your money back. Yes, that's how I work. Yes. I wish more people were that way. And, and people go like, oh, well, but people will, you know, just cheat and, 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 and take advantage. It's like the numbers on that are diminishingly oh, small. And honestly, if, if that's your vibe and if you can live with yourself, you know, mm -hmm. um, and be that out of integrity with yourself, mm -hmm. that you want to get a whole 90-day culture transformation project for free, Mm -hmm. um you know and and conspire to lie on such a massive scale mm -hmm. then i wish you all the very best of luck with your future endeavors yeah <laughs> because you'd be better to walk away and than... just give them the money it exactly. would, would not you, be worth the fight need more than just the money that i'm going to have to pay you back you're going to need way right. more than that you know yeah. so yeah yes exactly. we give you back your money and we'll walk away but that's never happened so yeah. Right. What factors would tweak those, the numbers you've already given me up or down, or what would be the dominant factors, which might influence that where you go, Whoa, okay, here was our original thing. Here's how long it's going to take because we learned X, Y, or Z. Right. So the factors that influence that for me, and I think I've already alluded to them. Number one is data and technology. So my accelerated program only works when we're working with the right tech partner, like a team for you, where we've, we've, we do the, the baseline assessment and we've got ongoing access to employee data and reports and, and we can drill down 
exactly mm-hmm. where the problems are. Um, so if we remove the tech and the data, immediately it's going to impact how long this is going to take us because it removes a crucial diagnostic tool first and foremost. And then furthermore, it removes um, the employee listening and the ongoing engagement and culture monitoring aspect of things. The other problem, if we remove the technology layer from from this um, equation is we lose access to the accelerator ability that the tech has got um, from an engagement and a, a public recognition and appreciation perspective. So when people feel more recognized and appreciated, it has a direct positive impact on their levels of engagement and performance. So if we take that away, um, it's going to take us longer to build that up through old school means with our technology and to build it up organically and to gain traction and you know mass mass adoption. So if mm-hmm. we remove the tech, the tech and the data, that's my biggest problem or my biggest fear. And then I can't I can't do the work that I do in 90 days. The other things, if they are not in place that will will snooker us um, ultimately are the other the other pillars that we need to be in place. So one of them being performance management. Um, if performance management is not ongoing, in other words, if you're going to continue to only do once a year or twice a year kind of appraisal, this isn't going to work. If your appraisals are going to continue to be based only on quantitative things, how much of what by when, instead of also incorporating qualitative things like relationships, psychological safety, you know, if it's just going to be about what you do and not also how you do it, it's going to delay because performance management is a lever that we can use to reinforce the culture that we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing that we need to be in place is the leadership development and coaching. If we remove the, the personalized leadership development and coaching and we want a one size fits all thing, again, it's going to extend the duration of the transformation program because instead of deploying what is needed where it's needed we're now having to get everyone to go through a massive leadership development program and cover Mm -hmm. modules that they possibly don't need Mm -hmm. and that's going to cost you extra time extra money um, and it's going to delay the entire project so i think if i had to really whittle it down to three main things that we need to be in place um, if we remove those factors, of course, the management leadership buy-in is is crucial. You know, if it turns out that that changes, then that's also going to have a negative effect. Um, but the three main things that we need to work miracles in 90 days is we need the data and the tech. Um, that for me is one thing. And then we need um, performance management and we need leadership development to be personalized and we need those to work together because with the performance management and the leadership development, the public recognition and appreciation, we're reinforcing the behaviors that we want to see and Mm -hmm. we are discouraging the behaviors that got us in trouble in the first place. Which formats or delivery methods would be most effective for the kind of training we've talked about? Okay, so what do I find to be most effective? I would say um, that we need more micro learning. So a lot of people prefer to learn on their own, on their mobile phone, um, mm-hmm. you know, quick bite-sized things, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, you know. They don't want to sit in a seminar room um, at a hotel um, for a whole day or for three days for us to teach them these things. So I find micro learning works really, really well. Mm-hmm. Self-paced, self-directed. Then we need to create community for them. And especially with adults, with with managers, with leaders, giving them a space to talk about their experiences and talk about what they've learned, whether it's, you know, on a Teams or a Zoom call or it's in person, but we need to give them 
that space. But what I'm finding is that our old school, we're going to put you on a three month program, you know, it just doesn't work anymore. I I don't think it ever actually worked um, because they don't have the time to go and sit. Um, they don't prioritize it. But when, when we make it smaller, bite-sized things, and again, because we are hyper-personalizing this, you don't have to do all 12 modules. You maybe only need to do three, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other missing link here between the, the micro-learning and the community, the other missing link is coaching and mentoring. So what I find to really work and why we can do this so quickly is because you're having a weekly call with your coach around what you've learned and what you've implemented at work. And there's that level of accountability. And Mm -hmm. the mentoring comes in where we use you as a peer mentor. So we've got the data. You're great at X, but not at Y. So you can mentor the people who need to get great at X. You know, and the people Mm -hmm. who are great at why can mentor you along with the micro learning and the coaching that you're doing with your coach. So, so that's what I find to work much more effectively than an old school one year long leadership development program or four months or whatever Mm -hmm. it is. This works a lot better. What things would determine the value? of organizational culture and leadership training. Now, I'm going to fork this at the beginning. This could be be either what you think the price maybe should be or the value in a less quantitative way in terms of, you know, unlimited because of X, Y, and Z, right? So you can choose either or, but please qualify if it's which one it is, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think that we... I think that we we go about this all wrong because it's, you know, all the models are telling us, you know, we shouldn't be billing for our time. We should be billing based on the, on the results, on the transformation, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately it's very difficult for a lot of organizations to really quantify the, the, the transformation because we can't guarantee it. What we see is a minimum of like a 14% improvement in employee engagement. Now, what is that worth to an organization, you know, to a small business or a, or a big organization? What is that 14% worth? Um, so for me, I think that honestly, we don't charge enough for our culture transformation projects. Um, and I think other, other companies charge too much based on, on what they do and the transformation that they, that they achieve, you know, mm-hmm. so I think that. Truly speaking, the, the, the transformation work is priceless. Um, but unfortunately we get asked to put a price tag on it and, and how that rolls into things is let's look at exactly how much time and effort we have to, we have to invest in this. Um, and to what extent, you know, can we guarantee a transformation and then just work in a percentage of what that is, you know, so if we say, you know, the, the fixed time is X plus a percentage of Y transformation, you know? Mm-hmm. So if a 14% improvement in employee engagement is worth $5 million to you, what's 25% of the $5 million? I feel like that should be what I should be charging. That should be my fee for, mm-hmm. for what I'm able to achieve for you. But yeah, we're we're not at the point where we're charging like that yet. But you are making me think that perhaps well, this is you what you should be doing. Yeah, I mean, I, but I mean, that's it, right? Even answering a question, I'm the same way. I'm I'm likewise ADHD. It's like in the middle of it, people may have a like hard what? time accepting yeah. that while answering a question, while actually talking, these new ideas come up like, Yes. We are we are verbal thinkers in that sense. Not always, because yes. I do a lot of thinking when my mouth isn't moving, but in the middle of speaking about something, a new it insight clar- comes up. It, it clarifies, yes. And a lot of people yeah. will misinterpret that as you didn't think before you spoke. I did. But I have the adaptability and the agility to admit mm-hmm. that while I was speaking, I had other ideas and I'm now voicing them to you. You right. know? 
And it doesn't have to be a fully formulated idea for me to speak it. Whereas for other people, it does. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think, quite frankly, we should be, you know, we should actually be charging a percentage of the transformation that we can guarantee. Right. And maybe that percentage is only due after a period of time. You know, for now, you pay us for the time for the transformation. You you pay for the tech, you pay for the coaching, you pay for this, you know. Um, and it costs so much per employee, um, per hour or whatever, how, whatever the model is. And then also, um, if you've maintained this over time and we've quantified, you've quantified what the transformation is worth to you, then you pay us. I think this is a brilliant idea, Tim. Mm -hmm. And my airports are dying. But yeah, I think that this is this is the way to go. There's a little there's a little bonus in it for all of us. If you there maintain you this, you know, and you maintain a fourteen percent improvement in employee engagement and that improvement leads to, you know, whatever other profits and performance, then yes, here's our bonus. Thank you very much. You're welcome right. for the transformation. <laughs> yeah. Ideally how often should this training take place? The question's a little funny after what we've already said, but yeah. So that is the frequency um, of the formal training. I think at least, at the very least. So the frequency, especially when we're busy with the transformation project, it's weekly, you know? Um, and because it's micro learning and there's coaching and stuff, the total investment that we're asking a manager for is maybe 90 minutes to two hours a week um, in that initial 12-week period where we're busy with the transformation. And then it kind of peters out. Um, but I, I would say it needs to be, in those early days, it needs to be kind of weekly or at least every two weeks um, so that people have got time to kind of assimilate what they've learned and, and go and apply it. Um, mm -hmm. And then after that, you need to at least be kind of still checking in monthly with like your you can call it like a little community of practice you know like your little your little group that you are going through the transformation with continue to meet monthly even if it's just for an hour um and one of the other things that you know i think is really great and, and you read a lot is having like a little book club like a corporate book club you know um and there's a book every month that we read and then mm -hmm. we take an hour to you know to discuss our corporate book club and what we've learned um so yeah i would say initially weekly and then after that at the very least you want some kind of monthly an hour or two opportunity to share learn reflect coach mentor yeah which types of between session support would be most beneficial yeah so i think the the between session support there's the internal and there's the external support, right? So the coaching and the stuff would be the external support. Um, and then the internal support has to continue um, in terms of the peer coaching and mentoring. So one of the things that we teach people to do is grow coaching um, as, a, as a coaching model and also the Oscar model so that they can coach each other. Mm -hmm. it's, also, it's also not about, you know, in, entrenching ourselves so deeply in the organization that they can never get rid of us. You know, it's mm -hmm. really about empowering them to be able to do these things for themselves. So in mm -hmm. between the micro learning or the book club or whatever, I would say the the peer coaching and mentoring needs to continue internally for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I like what you said there, because that's the thing. If it's like, if it becomes the point where they're now reliant on you, on us to continue what it is, then really effectively we fail well, because we, fail. we haven't taught them how to yes. to do this on their own right it's uh you know yeah. teach a man to fish kind of an idea okay 100 percent. We're, we're teaching them to fish and and to clean the fish and to cook the fish you know and mm. to preserve the fish that's what we're trying to do yeah mm. ideally how often should this be available it should be and again if you if you've got the right mechanisms i should be able to come to you as a colleague and say I need, I need coaching quickly. I'm stuck. You know, we should be able to go and grab a coffee um, and take 30 minutes and quickly solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't mm -hmm. be that I've got to wait a month for our next mentoring session to yes. be able to speak to you. 
yeah. yeah, that would be a waste of time. It goes back to my EFD. It goes principle. back to your example. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Realistically, how often it would be would it be practical and sustainable to offer this support? I think again, because realistically, because we're teaching you, so so this is what I advocate. Okay. So I advocate to work myself out of your organization within 90 days, kind of thing. Right. So Realistically, one of the first things I'm going to teach all managers in your organization is some basic coaching skills, you know, and how to use the grow model and, and how to have those conversations. So realistically, this is afford affordable and sustainable for so long as you employ managers who are mm -hmm. willing to listen and to take 30 minutes out of their day to help a colleague. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it should become self-perpetuating and self-sustaining. And it should become a, a, a part of the fabric of your culture. Um, where it becomes unsustainable is where it is external mm -hmm. and it is costing you money. So I've worked with organizations that have gone on to actually employ up to five full-time life coaches on their staff and have a formal life coaching program for all their employees as as a benefit you know mm. um but what what i want to see is i want to see every manager actually every employee eventually learning coaching skills everyone is a coach you can get assistance and coaching from anyone at any time right. all you need is willingness to listen and ask the right questions and that that vulnerability and that empathy and then it becomes self-sustaining um, mm -hmm. And there is no limit because there's right. always going to be someone who's available to listen and help you reflect and help you solve your problem. And what I got from that is that is perhaps part of the calculus that should be brought in in terms of pricing. That is saying, not only are we doing A, B, and C, but project into the future the, the lost money or the lost productivity, uh, basically since we are training our we're basically training ourselves out of your organization by training you mm -hmm. into that capacity mm -hmm. what is a future projected cost savings to you to use that as an anchor because you know it's going to be massive use that yeah. as an anchor to say by us doing not only what we're doing and using the technology that we are but basically training you to move us out of your organization within roughly 90 days here is all the additional money you'll save because we don't have to come back and save your butts that has additional value and use that as part of the anchoring not just for the basis mm -hmm. but for the ongoing and saying and you know a fractional cut of whatever and one of the things that it, I find really interesting is when you propose the idea of the performance basis like, well, we can't do that it's like so in other words if you're profits go up by 20 percent you would rather take zero percent than give away 10 percent of 20 percent let's say you let's say you get you of 20 percent you weren't ever going to have yeah, yeah exactly it's it's found money because the extra results you've got so it's yeah. literally money you didn't have so you would rather yeah. keep a hundred percent of zero yeah. than 90 percent of a lot more of which we have the accountability because if nothing increases that profit, we make we get nothing. nothing. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it, it's a win all around. But it's interesting because, uh, you know, that game has been played. You know, there's a sense of fairness where where people will would rather take zero than give half of ten dollars. Yeah. But yeah. it's also, I mean, look, that model has been tried and tested in the legal fraternity, you know, where, where mm -hmm. you work on a contingency, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and if I don't, no win, no fee, you know. If I don't win for you, then I don't get paid. Right. You know, so if I help you win the lotto, will you give me 40% of your winnings mm -hmm. um, for helping you win? You know, and, and if, if I don't help you win, if you don't win, I get nothing and you get nothing. It's simple. Mm -hmm. And, and some people will go for that and others won't. Um, yeah. and I think again, that's where we need to be adaptable and agile and say, well, we, we've got two pricing models, you know, right. Um, that's model one is like. the box standard and, and model two is this, and 
knowing what we know now about what we can do for model two and performance-based pricing, actually maybe we need to increase model one's pricing to compensate for the fact that some people aren't going to go for that. So yeah, you've, right. you've given me a lot to think about. The reason that I don't uh, don't want my guests to know the questions or prefer. Mm -hmm. I've had a request no, for the questions is it's sort of like if, if, if this is your area and you are an expert in this, if you're knowledgeable in it, you shouldn't need the questions. Yeah, I can, I can talk about it, you know, till the time right. from home, yes. And if you can't, yeah. then maybe it's not then a good match for the interview. <laughs> exactly. That's my point. Okay. So then the next one is how do you envision training, helping leaders address specific cultural and leadership challenges within an organization? I think training is, is but one piece of the puzzle, you know, so we can teach them some of the skills that they might be lacking, like how to give feedback, you know, that is candid, kind, and constructive. That's something that we can teach, but then we need the coaching and the mentoring to kind of re, you know, reinforce that. And mm -hmm. we need the other levers, which is the appreciation recognition layer and the performance management layer to reinforce those. Because mm -hmm. I can teach you how to give feedback that is candid, kind, and constructive, but you can still go out and be an absolute asshole about it and <laughs> and not, not do the, the feedback the way that we've taught you. And if you don't do the feedback the way that we've taught you, you're going to create a place where people are afraid of feedback or afraid of, of speaking up and, you know, um, so we need those other levers. So training, when we talk training, I'm thinking, you know, it's we're not talking about a, a facilitated workshop where people are, or coaching where people are kind of, where you're the guide on the side and they're coming to their own insights and they're learning from each other. Training mm -hmm. for me is old school. I teach you a skill. I teach you the grow coaching model. I teach you how to give feedback, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So training is but one part of it. It's an integral part, but where it really comes to life is through the coaching, the mentoring, and the measuring, whether it is through ongoing employee listening and mm -hmm. the data that we can get, or whether it is then through the results of 360-degree feedback, performance management -y kind of stuff, are you actually applying what you learned? Because if you're mm -hmm. not applying what you learned, we're not going to see the needle shifting. If you have to be my student forever, I'm doing a very bad job. Very bad job. Yeah. And I've, I've had cases where, you know, I've worked with groups, um, you know, where we do like manager training and leadership development, where it's like a hybrid thing. Um, mm -hmm. And we meet, say, once every two weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. And then I'll ask them, so... At the end of a session, I'll say, right, so what are you going to do differently when you go back into the workplace now? And then, you know, people are like, I'm going to do this and this and this. And then when we meet in two weeks' time, it's like, right, okay, so what did you apply? And then some of them are like, oh, no, I was too busy. to." And I'm like, what do you mean you were too busy? But, of course, you know, you, you don't say that on the session in front of everyone. But then you have other groups where you will teach the same stuff. For instance, Feedback that is candid, kind, and constructive is one of the big things that I that I, I find is very really useful for managers to learn because they don't know how to do it. And I've had people literally be like, oh, my God, I'm actually going to use this. I'm meeting a friend of mine tonight. And, you know, I'm actually going to use this model on them. And then when we meet again, it's like, okay, so, to, you know, last time you said you were meeting a friend, did you use the model? And then you have a Tim speak up and say, oh, my God, I did. And it worked so well. And mm -hmm. that's great. And again, that's the power of not just teaching something because you've always got those people in the room who aren't the early adopters and aren't willing to try it until they mm -hmm. know that some of their colleagues have tried it and it mm -hmm. worked. Right. So having that community and that place where people can come and talk and share um, that also reinforces the learning because Tim might have not been willing to do something until he heard at least one or two of his colleagues had tried it and it worked. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good too um, and, because it's social proof, right? Yes. It's not. Yes. It's not just hypothetical, but this person who has no investment in in selling it because they were sold the same thing as you. 
exactly. when a coworker, somebody you've known for a decade or decades says, look, I took that stuff we just learned and I used it and it worked. They'll believe that person way more, more than, than the trainer. Me. Yeah, oh, for yeah. sure. And, and they so, have every so reason is, to. Yeah. And that's where the magic happens. And that's why I'm such a big proponent as well of the ongoing coaching and mentoring within the organization because mm -hmm. it is more effective and more valuable than mm -hmm. investing in, in the external things. Considering the potential impact, if the training we've discussed were a course, and that's what we're talking about already, what pricing model would you find most appealing to, to, part, to your clients and to you if you were the client? I think, again, based on what we've discussed, I think using some kind of performance-based pricing, um, I think would probably be the way to go. Um, but again, I think clients won't go for it because especially if they don't have the mechanisms in place to monitor the effectiveness of this learning right? Um, on an ongoing basis through the employee listening and the 360 degree feedback, it's not going to it's not going to make sense to them because they're never going to be able to quantify the value. Right. And that gets back to compensating the price based on that saying you could actually qualify that saying, look, can you do A, B and C or do you measure A, B and C? It was like, OK, because you do that, we can offer you this other type of pricing where we're fully yeah. accountable. So yeah. it could be used as a disqualifying or qualifying question. As Next quali one. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and this is, uh, so the first one that you just answered, was that for the clients or for yourself? So that's what you'd, you think would be appealing to you if you are selling it to clients. Is that right? Yeah, but I think for clients as well, you know, if, if they can't quantify something, then you can't sell them on the value. Right. Okay. But so now you're the client. I'm selling you this or whatever, but some equivalent. So now you're the client. Is it still the same thing? Would you would you as the customer prefer a performance based pricing if it was trackable? I, based on who I am and how I operate, I could see no reason why I wouldn't. Right. Okay. You know, but everyone isn't. Everyone doesn't see the world the same way that I do, and there are yes, clients sure. who are not going to want that. You know. Yeah. But those like... are not those are not my clients. Those are not the people that. I should be working with. Right. Yeah. It's the, the idea, right? It's like, oh, so I'm not going to give you the found money that I don't have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you think about, when you think about the rationality of, of turning down performance-based pricing, it's laughable, but that's not the way humans make decisions. No, no. Right. But actually, like you say, this is a qualifying and a disqualifying question, because mm -hmm. if this is going to be your approach, then already mm -hmm. this should be a red flag for me that I shouldn't be working with you. Mm -hmm. That's because right. Because this means that you don't get the things the way that I get them and we're constantly going to be clashing. And quite frankly, then I should be giving you the numbers for those cookie cutter consultancies who are still trying yes. to do, you know, trying to build what they call diagnostic tools in Excel. I'll give you their number. And I wish you all the very best of luck working with right. them, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Who do you know who could benefit from being interviewed by me on these topics? Um, I know a couple of people, right? So, oh my God, I know so many people. So I would recommend my colleague and friends who mm -hmm. is very much into neuroscience. And I actually work with, he's got a company called Leadership. Same approach with hyper-personalized leadership development. We do all the same work. That's how we found each other um, on LinkedIn mm. is because we do the same stuff and we believe in the same stuff. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that you speak with um, I would recommend for workplace culture that you speak to my friend in Canada. He is amazing. And mm -hmm. he, one of the things that he said years ago that's always stuck with me is, your culture becomes the worst thing you are willing to tolerate. I love that. And that is just, right? Because it's like, no toxic culture starts out being super toxic. It's the mm -hmm. small thing. 
and we let it slide. And then it's the next thing and it's the next thing. And they're always progressively worse. Your culture right. becomes the worst thing you're willing to tolerate. So it's just the superstar. Um, who else? I would recommend that you chat chat to, to the, the, the guys who created, you know, so chat with um, just about the role of tech in improving employee engagement and mm -hmm. culture. Then another friend of mine here in the UK, who is also like a tech, a tech founder of, of a, a, an employee listening platform called, his name is, I would recommend you speak to him. He's amazing. He's also an ex big management consulting firm kind of a guy, mm -hmm. you know, so he understands that, that performance based results driven place mm -hmm. and how toxic and how bad that is for people. And their health and well-being. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, offline, I I can send you a whole list to really like Bless the you. connections it's that so I generous. have through through look done so many talks. I I can I can put you in contact with so many cool people. So I can give you a whole list. There is um, a really interesting lady. Her name is I can't remember her surname now. She does amazing stuff with. Um, with transformational leadership and spirituality mm -hmm. and retreats and um, psilocybin. So, so that's a whole other thing, to, a whole other rabbit hole to go down. I can give you a list. I know a lot of people who are amazing and can talk for hours about these things. Okay. So I will, I will DM you stuff and yeah, I've got, I've got a ton of people I could recommend that you speak to. Who do you know who is looking for guests who can speak on these topics, i.e. that I become their guest? Um, I'd have to check for you who, who's who got podcasts and who's working on what. But, yeah, I can I can put you in contact with some people. Um, he's constantly looking for guests. Um, there's a couple of other kind of work-related work management and leadership related podcasts mm -hmm. that I can, I can put you in contact with. Yeah. And I would honestly say like, you know, maybe you would want to reach out to who runs the HR podcast. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of a few people. I know many people, Tim. I can tell what questions, if any, do you have about these topics? I think I've got, look, I've got so many questions. I think one of the questions is, I think for me is just, why is it so hard? Why is mm. it so hard? And I, I don't expect you to be able to answer this, but I think it's, I think it's a, it's a rhetorical question and it's an, it's, it's almost a bit of an existential crisis that we all have is why is it so hard for so many people? And I mean, like neuroscience helps me understand part yeah. of the answer but why is it so hard for so many managers leaders business owners out there to get this stuff you know why why do we constantly feel like we have to be almost justifying our existence and constantly quantifying the value of the work that we do why after the pandemic, after everything the world has been through, you know, AI and all of the transformation that we're seeing, why is it still so freaking hard to get this work done? Why do so many people still just not get it? What do you think? I do have an answer for that, but I'm not going to give it on the call. But it's mostly about change takes effort, which consumes calories which reduces your ability to survive and reproduce and therefore putting in putting in hard work is something we are in a sense change is naturally um in a sense scary. aversive it's yes. scary but it's even aversive because change is what threat. kept you alive yesterday yeah right so let's let's have a neurobiology discussion about it uh, outside this call or another call or whatever because yeah, it's not it's not hard in a sense. It's not the whole answer, maybe, but it's definitely evolutionary and neuroscience based. Uh, very last one. 
how could I make this interview better? I've loved this interview. I think the only challenge that we've had is how long it's taken. Yes. Um, but that's partly my fault because I talk a lot and I talk to think. Um, so the I only way it. that we could have made this better is if we, if maybe we were stricter with, with ourselves around the time that we allocated for this. But I think right. we both had a bit of flexibility and it was easier. But maybe in future, if you speak to another person like me, um, who might waffle on and geek out mm -hmm. about certain things, you know, maybe we need to be a little bit stricter just about about time and maybe then just amend the questions or or skip ahead with some of the questions um, yeah. to make it shorter. But but I take full responsibility for how long this has taken because I I talk to think. Right. And well, we both I, geek out about these things. Right. And we both talk to think. And because I am like you in that way, I was very quite determined, actually, to make this a shorter phone call, literally feeling my lips. I did add, but I interjected less than I usually do. However, I really want my guest to talk until they're finished because I want to hear everything they have to say. But we'll never be finished so, talking, Tim, because there's true. so much for us to talk about. That's true. You know? There um, is. There is. I yeah. have super enjoyed this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, absolutely, we're staying in touch. We got a whole lot of names to exchange. And uh, let's see how we can collaborate and help help make each other better. That would be amazing. Thank you so much. Have a lovely evening. Take care. Okay. Bye, Deborah. Bye.